Curious Lloyd. Space might think of itself as a final frontier, but for boundless human creativity, it's just another hurdle to insanity scream our way over. Ever since our dog overlords first exited the Earth's atmosphere, the space agencies of the world have been hard at work to make the experience better, smoother, and most importantly, more terrifying. Alien looking space lizards that can stab you with their own ribs. Let's say you're walking on the beautiful countryside, minding your own business. Suddenly, you hear an awful noise and something lands from the sky. Was it a meteorite? An escape Michael Bay special effect? Or one of those North Korean missiles you keep hearing about? Venturing closer to the smoldering thing, you notice that it's a space shuttle. As the vessel's hatch slowly starts to open, you brace yourself for meeting some of the bravest, most sciencey men and women in existence, who you're never going to meet. Instead, out of the shuttle crawl these things. So several scenarios are running through your head, and none of them are pleasant. So are those aliens? They look a little more like lizard men, but we know they don't exist because I've already covered it. So maybe they used to be real astronauts, but encountered a space witch, which turned them into whatever the hell these things are. Either way, you're here, and those creatures are here, which leaves you rightfully buggered. Although in reality, those creatures are nothing more than humble Iberian rib newts, who are very much from Earth, but just happens to look like the most alien seeming things in existence. In their infinite wisdom and outstanding lack of irony, several space agencies have hauled these critters into space in six separate missions in order to study certain weird quirks of their fertility and regenerative abilities. But their fertility, much like that of humans, went a little haywire, and the space trip initially seemed to do a little favour of their healing abilities. But once they return to Earth, they actually appear to heal faster. So not only are we basically creating our own little green men, we are repeatedly exposing them to space to help them be more unstoppable. Not that they need any particular aid on that front, because the Rib Newt's main method of defence is turning itself into a spiky murder machine by straight up poisoning its own ribs and ripping them through its skin, Wolverine style. The Soviet MIR space station was slowly taken over by a living fungal goo. As the first modular space station, the Soviet MIR was a magnificent victory for space exploration. It was also such a famously majestic piece of crap that modern space agencies hated. The station's entire existence was one big experiment in human misery. It was a funky mess of exposed wires and duct tape that played host to space versions of disaster movies way more often than the things specifically designed to keep humans alive in super hostile environments should. On a schedule terrifyingly close to routine, the station's hapless crews had to tackle terrors ranging from extreme fires and power outages to deadly collisions that rendered entire sections of the station uninhabitable. The movie Armageddon didn't get a lot of, well, anything right, but it sure as hell nailed the Russian cosmonauts. However, the most infamous problem was that they found life in space. In a manner of speaking, in the confines of space, Garden variety moulds and fungus that found their way to the station became hazardous fungal goo that ended up overrunning almost the entire station. Space travelling is hazardous in so many ways, but a bit of poisonous fungal goo behind the panelling barely counts as worrying, surely. Well, apart from its toxicity, what you're all forgetting is the smell. Everyone always wants to forget about the olfactory aspect of space horror, but the MIR was overwhelmed with the galactic equivalent of bathroom sink sludge, and... Much like that sink slime, according to researchers, there was a very real chance that the MIR goofest station might mutate into strains that could be way more harmful to people on Earth than moulds. But if some of it actually ended up on the planet, it could potentially wreak havoc on the whole ecosystem. Of course, this never happened. Well, at least we think it never happened. The MIR didn't actually burn up completely in the atmosphere, and bits of it actually ended up in the Pacific. NASA tries to kill a sturdy bacteria, and accidentally creates an even stronger one. For many years now, NASA have been having a problem. The Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and particularly its High Bay 1 section, it's supposed to be the most sterile environment on the planet. The robots that roam the area to assemble various space appendages are routinely baked, rubbed with alcohol, bathed in hydrogen peroxide, and generally sterilized in a manner that will no doubt raise a few artificial eyebrows once the robot apocalypse arrives. Yet despite all of this, a single strain of particular hard bacteria called SAFR032 
has made High Bay One its home. In fact, it has invaded every single clean room NASA has. However, NASA has an ace up this sleeve. So, around 2001, they swiped a hefty sample of this bacteria off the Mars Odyssey that was about to be launched. NASA then strapped the sample to one of their powerful science balloons and let it fly 20 miles above the planet's surface, where the cold dryness and lens protection against the cosmic radiations roughly equals the conditions of Mars. They correctly presumed that dangling bacteria up there for 8 hours would be enough to kill it, and it was. Almost. Well, it killed about 99.9% .9 of it, which is a pretty good number if you're not dealing with angrily resilient bacteria. Several other space and lab experiments with the bacteria followed, up to and including a 2008 ISS experiment where the bacteria spores were exposed to space for an insane 18 months. Again, almost all the bacteria were killed. The problem is that the bacteria that survives these experiments tends to be a completely different level of beast than the ones going in. They seem to be highly resilient to antibiotics, and the survivors of the ISS experiment even started developing an increased tolerance to UV radiation, which is the bacteria's main weakness. So I'm talking about the kind of strain that our current spaceship cleaning techniques can't really remove, and that might not only get a ride from us once we eventually start colonizing, but it will even survive the conditions of a planet like Mars. But can you imagine the face of the future researcher who lands on the red planet, only to find out that the place is not only teeming with life, but the said life is just countless samples of the same bacteria that his space agency has spent decades fighting? ISS scientists accidentally create a two-headed space worm. Early in 2017, scientists grabbed a load of whole and cut-up flatworms aboard the International Space Station. Their aim was to mess around with the worm's considerable regenerative abilities. So think about a lizard growing back his tail. So they just wanted to see how they work in space. A number of weird anomalies soon presented themselves. A peculiar shock when exposed to fresh water and some metabolic changes. However, one of the flatworm segments wasn't going to have any of it. Out of the seemingly nothing but spite, this middle segment grew its head back, then it grew another head in its tail end, because that's what happens when you perform weird experiments on slimy creatures in space. But the scientists found it odd, so they cut off both the heads, to ship them and the middle section back to Earth for further research, at which point, the middle section sprouted two brand new heads in a place of the new ones that had already been lobbed off. Congratulations science, you took a bunch of tiny worms and worm bits and accidentally Frankenstein them. The Hell Cell Project When an institution that exists to take things to space starts dropping around terms like thinking of life as a technology, things start to look a lot less like let's go and put our flag on the moon and a lot more like we are Borg or the Terminator. And when the said institution starts talking about its experiments in synthetic biology as the Hell Cell Project, it's time to call Will Smith or the Avengers because there's no way robotic supervillain armies aren't going to be unleashed upon our unwary world. But NASA actually has a Hell Cell project going on, aiming to research the design and construction of new biological parts and systems and the redesign of existing new ones for useful purposes. So surely, this is some sort of fringe experiment, buried umpteen floors under the headquarters with a budget of zero, but it's actually a deathly serious project, headed by famed NASA astrobiologist, evolutionary biologist Lynn Rothschild. But don't just take my word for it, Here's Rothschild, explaining their jam in her own words. If you take an organism that can normally only live up to 80 to 100 degrees, and you give it some extra genes that maybe could allow it to live at a higher temperature. Now, it turns out high temperature is a relatively difficult thing to do, but say you take an organism and you give it a few extra genes to allow it to live at a pH zero, or maybe below, so in a very acidic environment, and then you can say, well, if this planet is very acidic and cold, and this and that, we can mix and match genes that would normally be found in nature together. So, there's probably a whole lot of science behind those layman's terms she's gracefully using for us non-NASA super geniuses. But if that doesn't sound like a load of space scientists splicing genes Bioshock style, then I don't know what does. But I'm absolutely not kidding about that. By the way, Rothschild goes on to say, But if you start thinking of life as technology, there is a lot of things we can do even something as bizarre as maybe generating electricity. So there you have it, electricity man. That's not prepping us for space. That's the opening speech for most of Spider-Man's villains. 
But still, I can't help but be kind of impressed with this sort of tenacious insanity. We, as a species, want to get off this planet so hard, and we are willing to start punching biology until either lightning comes out of it, or it willingly hands over its secrets. So please tell me, we can't colonize Mars within a couple of generations with an attitude like that.